critical that is very important one of the things that i hear people saying is uh inshira i have a horrible memory inshira when i read i cannot understand inshira when i read i cannot retain the information now what you need to understand is that nobody on this planet has a horrible memory your problem is not a retention problem but it is an attention problem let me take that again your problem is not a retention problem but it is an attention problem so no you don't have a problem about recollecting the information your problem is not about recollecting your problem is not about having a bad memory your problem is not about having a memory problem your problem is not about you are aging you are old you are getting old your problem is not about there are a lot of things on you your problem is about attention so it is not a memory retention problem rather it is an attention problem now so i want to share with you four tips real quick to be able to help you to navigate and be able to help you so that you can solve that attention problem listen to me nobody has a memory or retention problem your problem is an attention problem now why am i saying this because the way you study affect the way you remember what you are studying so what are these four tips that I want to share with you real quick to help you so you can understand what you are doing very well so you can recollect everything that you study very very well. The first one is preconceived judgments. There are a lot of you when you are studying or reading something or listening to something or watching something or uh, at, a, at a class or at a seminar or something you have preconceived a judgment already. You, you already have an idea, you think you have an idea about the subject already. You think you know something already about the subject. So because you have a preconceived judgment, you cannot assimilate, you cannot retain. Even if you listen to the thing, you cannot remember. Why? Because your memory is blocked and you cannot recollect anything that you have already had a preconceived judgment about. For instance, before you clicked on this video or you are watching this video, by the title, you have some preconceived judgments. And if you are a follower of my work for a long period of time now, you will know that I, I, there are certain things I'm going to be saying. There are certain statements I'm going to be making. There are certain things I'm going to be talking about. Oh, Ishra, forget about him. He, he, he's going to be saying this. What have you done? You have a preconceived judgment. You have a preconceived understanding about the topic that you are listening to, about the discussion that I'm having with you in this video. Because of that, chances are nothing you will re listen to, watch, or hear in this video will impact your life, will affect your life because you have a preconceived judgment. So one of the reasons why you think you have a bad memory is because you have what a preconceived judgment because if you have a preconceived judgment it reduces your attention for what you are studying you don't pay attention to it you are not keen to it you are not focused on what you are studying you, you are not mindful of what you are studying because you tell yourself that it is not important it is not necessary you already know what they are talking about you already know what the thing is about so your preconceived judgment blocks your memory from understanding and taking anything at all. So your problem is not a retention problem, it is an attention problem. And the reason why you cannot pay attention is because of preconceived judgment. The second thing that I see a lot about people having retention problem, which is actually an attention problem, is being full of yourself. There are a lot of you who are full of yourself. It, it connects with the first one, having a preconceived judgment. You think you know the thing already. Oh, you think you understand the thing already. You think this thing, Kra, is not anything already. So if you are full of, your, of yourself already and you are sitting and you are listening to somebody, no matter what the person is saying, your mind has closed. You think you are higher than that or you think that is not your level or you think that is not your style, that is not your swag, that is not your way of doing things or they can go to hell, that is a dumb for you. Once you think that way, you are not paying attention. Once you think that way, you are not focusing. Once you think that way, you are not observing. And if you are not paying attention, nothing is going into your memory. And since nothing is going into your memory, there is nothing you can recollect.
So in case you have that issue where you are full of yourself, you see, I've, I've gone to places where people are talking several times. People are talking and I literally can say the next word. Okay, I literally can say the next word and they will say it. I, I, I know what they're saying, but I pretend as though I don't know anything because you see, when you pay attention in that environment, there will be one nugget that is not part of what you know already and boom, you can add it to what you know already. That is what you must understand. That is what you must know when we talk about the issue in relation to having your attention right. So number one, having a preconceived judgment Number two, being full of yourself. Number three is that many people don't study as though they are going to be quizzed. You see, if you study as though you are going to be quizzed, there is a different way you're going to be studying. There is a different level of attention. Now, imagine I tell you to come and speak on a subject, maybe on coronavirus, on personal branding, on personal finance, on wealth, on politics, on governance. Imagine I ask you to speak on something like that. What are you going to do? And I'm going to be giving you some amount of money, maybe $20,000 or $30,000. That is your speaking fee. What are you going to do? You are going to do, uh, do some research and you're going to be paying attention to everything that you are getting because you know you have to present it before people. You know you cannot disgrace yourself. You know you're going to be quizzed about it. So if you study with the mindset of the fact that you are going to be quizzed and you cannot, you need to give an answer or you are going to teach somebody what you are learning or you are going to impact someone's life with what you are learning, you pay attention to what you are learning. You focus on what you are learning. You don't mess it up. You, you, you pay attention and there is no way you cannot retain what you are studying. That is very, very critical. That is very, very important. So study as though you're going to be quizzed. Even there are books I read and nobody will examine me on those books. But I have my highlighter. I am highlighting things. I have my red pen and the blue pen. I am taking notes because... Everything that I learn, I know I'm going to be teaching it one way or the other. So I pay close attention and I'm able to retain, I'm able to recollect. And the last thing is, many people cannot retain and they don't have attention while studying because they multitask. Because they multitask. You see, when you are studying, reading or doing something and you multitask, it doesn't make you well. So for instance, you are reading a book and your data is on, you're doing a WhatsApp, or you're reading a book at the same time listening to a music, you are not uh, uh, paying attention, or you are reading a book studying, but the TV is on, or something is on. You are multitasking. You jump from this, you go to that. You jump from this, you go to that. When you do that, you are not paying attention to one thing because it is only when you can pay attention to one thing, to a specific thing that you are doing at the time, that is where your memory can retain everything that you're doing. So for those of you who say, Inshira, I have a memory problem. Inshira, I can't retain information. Inshira, I cannot remember. Ask yourself these four questions. Do I have a preconceived judgment? Am I full of myself when I'm studying? Do I study as though I'm going to be quizzed or I'm going to be asking somebody? Or do I multitask whilst studying? The answer to these four questions will solve your problem of retention. And like I said, it is not a retention problem. It is an attention problem. So from today, if you're going to become successful, you're going to be able to understand to write your ACC, your CA, your SEMA, your CPA, your MBA, your finance, whatever it is that you are studying for, whatever it is that you are preparing for. If you can implement this right now in your life, I can guarantee you, you can understand everything and you can retain them as and when you need them and you can recollect them and become successful. So think about it. Comment below with any questions that you have and remember to subscribe to the channel and stay connected. I'll see you in another broadcast. Right there, so welcome to the broadcast today. Very much excited. This is the business lecture at the Wooden Show every single day from Monday to Friday, 4 p.m. or 16 p.m. GMT. I come your way live to lecture on various subjects, on various uh, topics. So if you're just joining the broadcast, comment below with any questions that you have. If you know a colleague, a friend that must join the broadcast and watch this video live, also remember to share the video as well with that person on your social media platforms, Facebooks, uh, uh, 
through Facebook pages, Facebook messengers, or WhatsApp platforms, you can share it so that we can get to reach a lot of people as much as possible. Today, we are continuing with our discussion on business finance in financial management. Uh, we are looking at the issue in relation to sources of finance, cost of capital, how to calculate cost of capital, what are the sources of finance to companies, uh, how can we compute the weighted average cost of capital. So all of those things, that is what we are looking at in this particular lecture. And this is the third part of it. We started this on Tuesday with a part one, and then yesterday we did a part two, and then today we are looking at the part three. I'm hoping that we'll be able to conclude it today, but if you're still not able to conclude today, we will continue tomorrow as well to finish with this topic because cost of capital, sources of finance, uh, how to calculate the cost of equity, how to calculate the cost of debt, how to calculate the weighted average cost of capital. These are fundamental issues that you must understand, that you must get into because whether you like it or not, for your financial management examination, this question is going to be there so it is very important for you to understand it if you have any questions you know what to do put them in the comment box i'm going to be reading all your comments and reply to them live on the channel to help you to prepare well for your examination so let's get into the discussion today cost of capital cost of equity in relation to that so yesterday we established the fact that when it comes to uh, the two things we are answering in this uh, series, in this three-part series so far, we're looking at sources of finance or business finance in general. And I said, when it comes to business finance, there are two questions we ask ourselves. Where do we get the money from and what is the cost of the money? Where we get the money from is the sources of finance to the organization. And then what is the cost of money is the required rate of return. Is the required rate of return so what money or how much must we make in order to pay the providers of finance that is the required rate of return and we look at the theory aspect which is the sources of finance we saw the long-term sources of finance the short-term sources of finance in case you missed those uh, lectures we are going to uh, put a link in the description or you can check the playlist understanding financial management and you can see the three parts videos there to be able to assist you to uh, understand what we've done so far so you can understand what we are about to do today so yesterday we concluded on the fact that when it comes to cost of capital it depends on where we are getting the funding from if we are getting the funding from equity that is from shareholders then we are going to calculate the cost of equity that is ke if we are getting the funding from debt or debt finance then we are going to calculate the cost of debt that is kd if we are getting the money partly equity partly debt or the capital structure of the organization is both equity and debt then we are going to be calculating what the weighted average cost of capital so yesterday we concluded on uh, calculating the cost of equity and we mentioned real quick that there are two broad methods that can be used in the computation of the cost of equity. What did we say? We said we can use the dividend module, okay, or we can use the capital asset pricing module. So the dividend module or the capital asset pricing module. Now, with the dividend module, we said there are two sub uh, methods under that. That is, whether the company is paying constant dividend okay constant dividend or whether there is a constant growth in the dividend so whether the entity is paying constant dividend that is the same amount of dividend from one year to another or there is a constant growth in dividend so based on these two constants we wrote our formula down that ke equals do over po this is where we assume there is what? A constant dividend. But if there is a constant growth in dividend, we say KE equals VO out 1 plus J over PO plus J. Then one statement I made yesterday that's very important is that if we are doing business valuation, something we'll be doing later on, if we are doing business valuation, 
This formula is to be the same, we just change it up. Why? Because the BO is your dividend, the BO is the market price per share, and then your G is the growth rate. Okay? Then one thing I mentioned was that the market price that we are bringing here should be the ex div market price and not the cum div market price. So I gave a distinction between the ex div market price and the cum div market price in relation to that. So this is where we ended la uh, yesterday. So we want to build it up from there in relation to that. Now, one thing you must understand is that when it comes to using the growth in the dividend formula, that is the G, Growth can be computed from various ways. So the G growth can be computed using various uh, scenarios. The first one is that the growth rates can be calculated using task dividend. So if we are using task dividend to compute it, then the growth rate is going to be the nth root of the final dividend, okay? divided by the initial dividend minus 1. The final dividend divided by the initial dividend minus 1. Okay, that's Q, uh, the nth root of final over the initial dividend minus 1. So that is the first way we calculate the growth rate. Now, this N here means the number of periods that we are seeing what? The growth rate. The number of periods that we are seeing the growth Compute the growth rate using the past dividend. So let me get to my slide real quick on that. Okay. We take it from there. So we and XPLC has paid the that has paid out the first has paid out the total dividend in the past three years. So we have nineteen ninety eight, nineteen ninety nine. It is now two thousand and one. So they paid a dividend for five years, and they are nine thousand, thirty two thousand, thirty one thousand. And then 33,000. So these are the dividend payouts for the organization for the five year period. The requirement is estimate the average growth of dividends per annum. Estimate the average growth of dividend per annum. Now, this is where I want you to understand using here, like I mentioned yesterday, I'm using the open tuition kit because we have. Uh, questions on simple questions in there but later on we'll be solving real exams questions in relation to that so let's go now what is our formula we said the growth should be equal to nth root of the final dividend divided by the initial dividend minus what one the final dividend divided by the initial dividend minus one so how do we go about it in relation to that so the way we go about it is, okay, we ask ourselves, what is the final dividend? This is the final dividend. So this becomes the numerator. What is the initial dividend? The first one is the initial dividend. But the end, end here, you have to ask yourself, what is the growth period? And this is where you've got to be careful. Even though we have five periods here, the end we're going to be bringing will be four. Because growth is from a year to another year. So from 1996 to 1997, 1. 97 to 98, 2. 98 to 99, 3. 99 to 2004. So even though there are five periods, our nth root is going to be 4. And this is a concept you have to understand. Anytime you are calculating growth rates, dividend growth rate, or earnings growth rate, remember the same concept can also be used to calculate growth rates in the earnings of the organization if you are doing business valuation and other things. Then, so if it is five periods, the end will be four because growth rate will be from one year to the other. So if we substitute that in here, so fourth root, final dividend, 33,000, 
Okay? Initial dividend, 28,000. Minus one. Now, the minus one is on its own. The square root doesn't cover the minus one in relation to that. I see a comment from uh, a champo. I will read that and reply to you in a moment. So, that is the formula. So, remember, growth rate has to always be expressed in what? Percentages, okay? Growth rate has to always be expressed in percentages. So, when we do the arithmetic for this, we are supposed to get 4.2% per annum. 4.2% per annum. So you can punch that on your calculator and see what you get. So from this formula, if we are using the growth rates to calculate the dividend for the organization, the G computation, we can use what? Past dividends. If we are using past dividends, that is our formula. The nth root of final over initial minus one. And this is the first thing that we have used to calculate the annual dividend. So that is the first formula we can use to compute the growth rate in the dividend. Then the second method that we can use to calculate growth rate is what is called Gordon approximation. Gordon approximation. Now, somebody may ask, Ishira, in the exam hall, which one will I use? Would the examiner state it, past dividend or golden approximation? It is based on how the examiner structures the question, that is how you will be able to uh, do that in relation to it. It is how, so the way the examiner structures the question, that is how you will determine which formula you are going to be using. So, with the golden approximation, we said growth rate, which is the gene, equals R times B. Growth rate, which is the gene, equals R times B. So, what is R and what is B? So, let's take them. Remember that gene is always the growth rate. So, your R is the required rate of return of reinvestment of the money. The required rate of return of reinvestment of the money. And then the B is the proportion of earnings retained. The proportion of earnings retained. Okay? So if we want to calculate the growth rate using Gordon approximation, it is going to be G times R, sorry, G equals R by B. Where R is the required rate of return of reinvestment of the money, and then B is the proportion of the earnings that the company retains. That will help us to calculate the Gordon approximation, which is the, or to calculate the growth rate using the Gordon approximation. So I see some questions there. Let me look at them real quick, then we can continue. Is there there? Okay, Achampon statement said, very informative. Thank you, Achampon. Then Achampon says again, I would appreciate if you draw the timetable for us to know what subject will be next. Okay, uh, Achampon statement. Stephen, the thing is that I designed the course based on questions that we have received. All right? Based on questions that we have received. So, I cannot tell you that, okay, tomorrow I can do this, or tomorrow, and this day I can do this. So based on the questions we receive and the subjects, that is how we design the course. So all we could do, uh, one thing that will help you is that you have to check my community tab. So on the channel page, you will see uh, home video, and then home video playlist and community. On the community tab, I, we usually post some updates there on the next thing that you have to be looking out for so you can keep in touch on the community tab where we'll be informing you on what we'll be covering in, uh, in the day so that you'll be able to follow suit in relation to that. But if you have any questions in any subject, there is a specific topic in any subject you want me to cover also, a child point, you can put it in the comment box and uh, we will arrange and make time for that. Like this topic we took from Tuesday. 
all right? We did it on Tuesday, we did it yesterday, but I realized that we still cannot finish, so I still need to do it today. And if today we are not able to finish with this topic, I will continue with it tomorrow because this is a fundamental topic in financial management and it will be great that I touch it and I, uh, I finish it. So at Champaul, that is how it is. You, I designed a course based on the questions that we have. So certainly, you can check the community tab and you have updates on what we're going to be doing next in relation to that. So using the Gordon approximation, how do we deal with that? So let's look at a question here using the Gordon approximation. So I'm reading. Why PLC retains 40% of earnings each year and is able to reinvest so as to earn a return of 20% per annum? Required. What is the expected rate of growth in dividend? So the company retains 40%. So B is going to be 40%. But can reinvest at what? 20%. So if we want to calculate our growth rate, what will be the growth rate? G will be equal to 40% times 20%. Simple. Simple. So 40% by 20%, that is going to give us 8% per annum. So the growth rate in dividend is 8% per annum. So like I said, the question, it is based on the question that we will decide whether we are going to be using the Gordon approximation or we are going to be using what? The past dividend. If in the question you are giving dividend for a number of years and you are supposed to calculate the cost of equity and you need to use the growth method, that means that you use the past dividend to calculate the growth rate. However, if you are not giving past dividends but you are told how much profit the company makes, how much profit the company retains, then you have to calculate the percentage of the profit retains. Then, from that question, the examiner will give you the required rate of return. You multiply the two up, and that will give you the growth rate. And this time around, you will be using what? The Gordon approximation. So these are the two methods, approaches, or techniques that are used in the computation of the growth rates. The growth rates. So now that we've seen how we can compute the growth rate, let's go into how we can now answer some real-time questions using each of the formulas that we have here. So let's see some of the questions I have here. TPLC has an issue, 50 cent shares with a market value of 4.25 per share. A dividend of 40 cents per share has just been paid. Listen carefully, yesterday I told you something. That when it comes to the dividend payment, you have to be careful. Has just been paid or is about to be paid. Because if the dividend has just been paid, then the share price that will be given to you is X div. And that is what you are interested in. But if dividend is about to be paid, then the share price given is cum div. And so to get the XD price, you must subtract the dividend. How we get that constant work? We established that yesterday and I explained that thoroughly in, that, uh, in, in yesterday's discussion. So looking at this question we have here, we are told that TPLC has an issue 50 cents uh, shares with a market price or market value of $4.2 per share. A dividend of 40 cents per share has just been paid. Dividends are growing at 6% per annum. Require, what is cost of equity? What is cost of equity? So from this question, dividend is growing. We have been given the growth rate in the dividend. So it means that in order for us to calculate the cost of equity, In order for us to calculate the cost of equity for TPLC, we are supposed to use what? The growth rate. So TPLC, that is going to be KE equals DO 1 plus J over PO plus J. Right? So let's look at the question. Let's see the preamble in the question. The market value PO is giving us $4.2 
Then the dividend, which is the O, is given to us as 40 cents. 40 cents can be translated at uh, 0.4 Okay? 0.4 dollars. Because when you are working, you must work in one uh, unit of the currency. If you are working in cents, you work all in cents. If you are working in, do uh, in the absolute dollars, you work all in the absolute dollars. Then the growth rate has been given to us 6% per annum. So based on this information that we have, remember, the 50 cent share that is in the question, that is the nominal value of equity. We, don't, we are not interested in the nominal value. It is the share price we are interested in. So that is what we're going to be using. That is why the 50 cent in the question will not be valid for us. So our KE will be equal to DO, which is the dividend. 0.4 out, 1 plus the growth rate, 0.06, all divided by PO, 4.20 dollars, plus the growth rate, 0.06, okay, 0.06. So that is how we do our workings, and you punch all of them on the calculator, and 0.1%, 16%. So, if this is now what? The cost of equity. The money that we are obtaining from shareholders, whether we are using retained earnings or it is a new way to be paying for it and the returns is going to be what? 16.1% in relation to that. Let's look at another. It says SPLC has a value of 2.4 per share. The share has just been paid. A constant dividend of $30. So if you see in this question, there is no growth. It means we'll be using what? The native or the original formula. So if you are using the original formula, KE will be equal to DO over PO. Now, in this question, we are told the market value per share is $2.40, then the dividend that has just been paid is $0.30, cents, which is $0.3 uh, for the organization. So once we have that, our cost of equity will be equal to um, $0.30 cents over $240 cents times 100. Remember I told you that all these formulas will be times 100 because cost of equity will be in percentages. So when we do the arithmetic, we should be able to get 12.5%. So that is the cost of equity in relation to that. So that is how we deal with the issue about cost of equity. If there is growth, we use the growth rate. If there is no growth, we use the native formula to calculate our cost of equity in relation to that. But remember what I mentioned earlier, that when it comes to cost of equity, two formulas can be used to calculate the cost of equity. Either we are using the dividend module or we are using the capital asset pricing module. So let's go into the capital asset pricing module and see how companies can use that in order to uh, calculate the cost of capital. So real quick, give me a moment. Let me quickly plug my MiFi. Now, 
So let's go to the second way cost of equity can be calculated, and that is using the capital asset pricing module. You see, the limitation about using dividend module to compute the cost of equity is that one, there is no constant growth in dividend. In other words, companies in natural sense don't have constant growth in dividend. So that is a limitation about using the dividend to calculate the cost of uh, 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 capital or cost of equity of the organization. Another limitation is that this uh, method here, that is the dividend uh, module to calculate the cost of equity, does not consider the risks associated with the shares of the organization or the risks in the industry of the organization. So as you can see, there is no risk factored into in this formula. So it is based on this limitation that the capital asset pricing module was developed as an alternative method to be used to calculate the cost of equity. So let's look at the concept about the capital asset pricing module. So like I said, the capital asset pricing module is going to be solving the myth about risk. And you know, risk is very, very important. If we are calculating cost of equity or we are calculating the weighted average cost of capital, risk associated with the investment would have to be taken into consideration. But if you use the dividend valuation module, it hasn't considered any risk. It doesn't consider any risk. So how do we put risk into the cost of equity that we want to compute? That is where the issue about the capital asset pricing module actually comes in. Now, in dealing with the capital asset pricing module, there are what we refer to as business risks that uh, uh, organization go to or experience. And there are a couple of business risks that you must uh, understand because some of them are inherent risks, there are control risks, there are uh, det uh, detection risks, we have strategic risks, we have compliance risks, we have financial risks, we have operational risks. There are various risks that are associated with an organization, but all those risks can be subdivided into two categories. So we have what we call systematic risk and then unsystematic risk, okay? So all of these risks that I've mentioned can further be divided into two, the unsystematic risk and then the systematic risk. The idea about this is that the unsystematic risk is the risk specific to the company under discussion. So this is a risk due to factors within the particular company. So if, for instance, there is a poor labor relation or the appointment of new managing director, that is a risk that is specific to an organization. If an organization launches a product and the product fails at the end of the day, that is a risk to the organization. And that type of risk is called unsystematic risk. Now I see a question, I'm going to be answering that in a moment. Then we have systematic risk. The systematic risk is the same as what we call the market risk. What do we mean by that? This is a risk due to general economic factors, such as the level of inflation or the changes in exchange rates. The level of inflation or the changes in exchange rates. Note that companies can diversify or investors can diversify on systematic risks, but they cannot diversify systematic risks. Get that very well. Investors can diversify their investment portfolio in their own systematic risk. In other words, if I'm investing, I won't put my money into one company, maybe Tesla, I won't put my money only into that, Microsoft, maybe Amazon, I won't put my, co I won't put my shares, my, my money into just one of those companies. In order for me to uh, reduce the business risks, uh, or company rates or unsystematic rates, I would decide to invest a little in Tesla, a little in Microsoft, a little in what? Amazon. When I do that, I have diversified the unsystematic risks or the specific risks. But the systematic risk, which is the market risks, I cannot diversify it because the rate of inflation will affect everybody irrespective of the, economy, uh, the industry that you are in. 
the exchange rate will affect everybody irrespective of the economy that you are in. So the idea about rates we must understand is that all business rates are further divided into two. All systematic rates, these are rates specific to the company. They can be diversified by the investor by investing in more than one company. But systematic rates are market rates and those cannot be what? Diversified. So let me answer the question that I see, or the, let me look at the comments that I see there. This is Olupo Steven. I say hello, Prof. Under the dividend module, using square root. Please, can you explain more? I still don't get it. Dividend module using square root. Are you talking about calculating the growth rate? Olubo Steven, uh, is that what you're talking about? Are you talking about the growth rate? Because under the dividend module, if we are calculating the growth rate using the uh, past dividend, that is the formula where the square root comes in. So it becomes G equals the nth root of the final dividend over the initial dividend minus 1. That is the formula. So the square root we are using there is to help us to calculate the growth rates, and that is the formula if we are going for the past dividend approach. Did I answer you right? So under the dividend module, this square root thing is used in the growth calculation, and not the main KE, because you remember in the, you can see in the main KE, we are not using any square root, but the root sign is applied if we are calculating dividend in relation to that. Okay, so Olupo Steven, that is that. Uh, uh, does it make sense for you now? I hope you understand it now. So the square root there is for the calculation of the past dividend, and the formula is G equals the nth root of final minus initial minus one. The nth root, and we have I've explained to you that the nth root is always going to be. Uh, if they give you five years, it means the nth root will be four. If they give you four years, the nth root will be what three. And then you pick the final div over the initial div. Then you punch fourth root of that, and you subtract one from it, and that gives you the growth rate. Let me know if it's uh, clear now, or if you have any other question. You can also put it in the comment box in relation to that. All right, so under the capital assets pricing module, what do we do? How do we deal with it? So let me put the formula down real quick. With the capital asset pricing module, we said RF plus the beta into brackets RM minus RF. Okay, so this is the formula for dealing with the capital asset pricing module. So what is the meaning of this? Where the RF is the risk free rate, I'm going to explain this in a moment, then RM is the return on the market or return from the market. And then the beta there is the risks associated with the shares of the company. So that is equity beta. Equity beta. Now I want you to follow me carefully here because I'm going to be dropping some bomb that will be critical for you to understand what is happening about this. So the risk-free rate is the interest rate on government bonds, treasury bill. Those kind of bonds have no risk. So the interest rate on such bonds are brought. Then the return on the whole market. So what return is the whole market giving to us? Then the B here is the equity beta. Now what is the difference between equity beta and asset beta? What is the difference between equity beta and asset beta? Equity beta is the risk of the shares of a company. Okay? Equity beta is the risk of the shares of a company. And then the asset beta is the risk associated with the entire market or the industry. 
So equity beta is for the company. If you buy these shares, this is the risk you are going to be facing. That is equity beta. Asset beta means if you go into this industry, if you go into this sector, this is the risk that you are going to be associated with. So that is the difference between equity beta and asset beta. Why am I emphasizing on this? Because there are times when a company wants to diversify. So let's say a company that is in uh, healthcare. So they've been in healthcare and all of a sudden they want to diversify into education. What you must understand is that the risk, uh, the asset beta of the healthcare industry is different from the risks involved in the educational industry. For that reason, if the healthcare company want to appraise the projects they want to undertake in the education industry, they must get the asset beta in the education industry and use that to re-gear their equity beta before they will be able to calculate what? The capital asset pricing module, which will then be used to appraise the project. I hope it makes sense. It makes sense, right? So if we are dealing with equity beta and asset beta, that's what is going to be happening. The reason why these two could come up is because of diversification. So when a company is moving from one industry to another industry, it may get the asset beta of that industry or get a, a, a company in that industry, a proxy company, and calculate the, use the equity beta of that company to calculate the asset beta of that industry, then that asset beta will be used to come and re gear the equity beta, and then we can now use that to calculate what? Asset pricing module. Now, in doing that, there are a couple of things that you must understand in relation to that. Okay, I think I have a question here for that. So let me see if I could get this formula sheet to put this for you now so that we, we, we can take it from there. Okay. All right, so you guys continue. I'll touch on that when we are going. So the capital asset pricing module. So let's look at some questions about the concept in the capital asset pricing module in relation to that. So let's go question one. Let's see what we have there. It says QPLC, QPLC has a beta of 1.5. The market is giving a return of 12% and the risk free rate is 15%. What will be the required? So we are told that the company has an, a beta, that is the equity beta of the company is 1.5. So our beta is 1.5. The return on the market, RM, is 12%. And then the risk free rate is 5%. Now, let me make this comment very important. You have to note that the return on the market minus the risk free rate is equal to risk premium. It's very important. I don't forget that. It escaped me, but I, I, let me talk about it here. The return on the market minus the risk free rate is the risk premium. So there are times in the question, the examiner will not give you return on the market. He will only give you the risk free rate, the beta, then he will give you risk premium. In that case, all you will do is to use that risk premium to multiply the beta and add it to your risk free rate, and then you are good to calculate the capital asset pricing module. But what is the meaning of that risk premium? It means the extra benefit that the investors will get for investing in your company. Because if, for instance, if, for instance, there is a risk free rate, okay, of whatever amount, if you buy government bond, you are assured that you will receive your money, okay, the market is giving a certain amount of return. So if we subtract 
the returns from the market or the, the risk free rate from the returns from the market, they will get the risk premium. Now, the higher the risk premium, the higher that the benefits that the investors will be having at the end of the day. So that is the idea about what? The risk premium. So from this question, the capital asset pricing module computation will be as follows. What do we have? The risk free rate is 5%. Plus our beta 1.5% into brackets, return on the market is 12% minus the risk free rate again 5%. So we punch it out arithmetically and let's get what we get from the for the capital asset pricing module or the KE. Okay? So the capital asset pricing module or KE, cost of equity, is the same concept uh, here. Now so if we punch that out. Let's see. If we point that out, we're going to have 15.5% as the cost of equity, or if you want, the required rate of return. The required rate of return. Let's look at another question. Our PLC has. No, let me look at this one rather. SPLC is giving a return of 20%. The stock exchange as a whole is giving 25%. The return on government securities is 8%. The return on government securities is 8%. The question we are being asked is, we should calculate the beta. So look at how this one is. We are going to be calculating the beta in this case. So how do we go about it? We will just go to apply change of subjects. Okay? Then we go away. So, the capital asset pricing module, which is the same as cost of equity, will be the risk free rate plus the beta return on the market minus the risk free rate. So, let's see what we have in the question. We are told in this question that SPLC is giving a return of 20%. SPLC is giving a return of 20%. Now, if the company is giving a return of 20%, then that becomes what? Our cost of capital. So that's 20%. Then we are told that the stock market as a whole is giving a return of 25%. If the stock market as a whole is giving a return of uh, 25%, then that would be what? The return on the market. Okay? 25%. Then it says, and the return on government securities is 8%. That is an experience. 8%. So 8% here. Plus the beta. In this question, we are looking for the equity beta. We want to look at the riskiness of the shares of the company. So if you are looking at the riskiness of the shares of the company, what do we do? We make the beta the subject. All right, so let's let's do the arithmetic. This is kg two mass plus beta. This minus this of um, eight twenty five minus eight is going to be five seventeen percent. Right. So we are making beta the subject. So if we are making beta the subject, this has to move. It will be twenty percent minus eight percent equals. 17% with a beta, then we make beta the subject, and this minus this will be 12% over 17%. Make sense? 12% over 17%. This is kg2 mass. So when we do the arithmetic, let's see what we have there, and that is going to be around 0 0.706. That becomes the beta or the riskiness of the shares of the company. So what are we saying here? In the second question, the company is giving a return of 20%. The risk free rate or interest on government bonds is 8%. Then the returns on the market, the whole stock exchange is giving us a return of 25%. So we are supposed to calculate the equity beta, the riskiness in the shares of the company. 
and in this case, the riskiness in the shares of the company, we will substitute it, make beta the subject, and it became 0 0.7. Now, 0 0.7 means like the risk is very low, all right? The benchmark is one, so everything is very low. But to determine the riskiness, we have to compare it with another company. So if we compare this company to another company, and the equity beta in that company is 1.5, that means the shares in that company is having what? A high risk. In that case, if you are going to invest in that company as a shareholder, you have to demand a higher return. But if you are investing in a company where the equity beta is 0 0.7, 0 0.06, it means the risk associated with the shares is very low. So in that way, the returns here will be less than the returns you would have had if a company has 1.5 equity beta in relation to that. So the higher the equity beta, the higher the required rate of return. The lower the equity beta, the lower the required rate of return. So this is what you have to understand when we talk about the issue in relation to capital assets pricing module. Now, like I said, the capital asset pricing module concept can be used in investment appraisal. Okay, the capital asset pricing module concept. Now, if you have any question, please put it in the chat box. I'm actually preparing to wrap up for this uh, today, but I'm going to conclude on the capital asset pricing module being used with investment appraisal. Then we conclude. So, if you have any questions, start putting them in the chat box, and I'll look at the questions and I'll answer them, then we'll sign off today. And certainly tomorrow, we have to come back and to conclude it. So tomorrow we'll do the fourth part of this standard and then we will look at, of this topic, and we'll look at the cost of debt and then as well as the weighted average cost of capital. So if you have any questions, leave them in the comment box and then let me look at it in relation to that. So let's look at the final question about investment appraisal. It says, TPLC is all equity finance. It wishes to invest in a project with an estimated beta of 1.4, which is significantly different from the business risk characterized of an outlay of $100,000 and is expected to generate returns of $50,000 per annum in perpetuity. The company the market return is 11% and then the risk free rate is 6%. Now, this company is all equity finance. This company is all equity finance. So in such a question, before we deal with the investment appraisal, now for those of you who want investment appraisal, I already have a video on investment appraisal. Everything on investment appraisal is <laughs> You check the playlist called uh, Understanding Financial Management. I did a whole series on investment appraisal. So you can check that playlist and then you'll be able to uh, uh, go through that. So if we are calculating the capital asset pricing module for this question, remember, we are giving the beta for the uh, investment, which is 1.4. We are told that the company's return has also been given to us. So the, the returns that we are going to be using, the capital asset pricing module or the KE we are going to be using here is going to be the free, risk free rate 6% plus the equity beta of 1.4 and then return on the market 11% and then 6%. So when we do the arithmetic, that will give us what? 13%. So in this case, the company itself is not having their asset beta. So we use the beta of the investment trader to calculate what? The cost of capital or the cost of equity. And that is what we will use to appraise this particular project in the question. Now, like I mentioned earlier, this is diversification. But assuming we're giving the asset beta of the company, and we were also giving the, uh, sorry, we're giving the equity beta of the company. And then we now have the asset beta as 1.4 given to us for this project, we would have re-geared it 
and then calculate a new uh, equity beta, which would have been used to calculate the capital asset pricing module. But in this question, it was straightforward. We were not giving equity capital uh, equity beta, so we go straight to the point and then use that to calculate our thing there. So this is what you have to understand about calculation of cost of uh, equity. I believe that you understand the concept, you understand the treatment very well in relation to that. So remember, like I said, this is a broad topic, it's a huge area for us writing financial management, uh, ACCA, ICA, or whatever finance, finance that you are writing. Something about these guys are going to be there. So make sure you join me same time tomorrow, 4 p.m. As we conclude on this particular topic, I know it's been a long uh, session. This is the third day. Tomorrow will be the fourth day. But it's important and it is broad. So I need to be able to cover all of them. So God willing, tomorrow, same time at 4 p.m. or 1600 GMT, I'm going to meet you and we will look at the last aspect. So tomorrow we will jump straight to look at cost of debt. When it comes to cost of debt, to calculate the cost of debt, we have to determine whether it is a redeemable debt or an irredeemable debt. Okay? A redeemable debt or an irredeemable debt. So we we'll use that concept to deal with cost of debt. Then from there, we we'll look at the weighted average cost of capital. That is, if the money is coming from debt and it is coming from equity, or if the company is financed, with debt and equity, then in that case, when we are doing any project, we need to appraise the project using the weighted average cost of capital. So we will continue with this tomorrow. Remember, if there are any questions that you have, you put them in the comment box, you put them in the chat box, and I'm going to be answering all of that for you in relation to that. So I see a question, let me answer that real quick. Before, if I was sign up, so Olupo Steven, can we use camp for project specific and combine projects? Can we use camp capital asset pricing module for project specific and combine project? Uh, Steven, I don't get your question real well. Maybe you can clarify. Can we use come for a specific project and combine projects? When we say com when you say combine project, what do you mean? So please clarify your question for me so it will help me to answer you better. Like I said, if the company is undertaking a project and they want to appraise the project, taking into consideration the rates involved in the project, then it will be prudent to use the capital asset pricing module to calculate the cost of capital or cost of equity rather than using the dividend valuation module because the dividend valuation module doesn't factor or consider the issue in relation to uh, risk. So in order for us to incorporate risks into the investment project, we can use what? The capital asset pricing module. And so we can use that for a project. But when you say combined projects, maybe you can clarify that for me and I'll be able to answer you better. Okay. So maybe you can clarify, Steven, if you are still online, you can clarify for me, then I can uh, answer that for you. Now, if you are watching and there are any topics you want me to cover, remember, I designed this course based on popular requests from topics students send to us. So if there are any topics you want me to cover, feel free, put it in the comment box or put it in the chat box and I'll be covering that in one of the videos for you. Every single day we go live from Monday to Friday at 4 p.m. or 1600 GMT. And today we continued with our discussion in financial management lectures and we are looking at business finance to be specific. We are looking at sources of finance and cost of capital. How do you calculate cost of capital? What are the sources of finance of an organization? This is critical topic in financial management, F9, uh, in ACCA or ICA financial management, advanced financial management, it's also something that you need to understand. That is why 
we take in time to spend uh, a lot of time on this in relation to that. So this is where I'm going to be concluding today. Okay, Olu Jacob, can I type a question relating to that? Yes, you can type a question. That is, if it's not a long question that I can read. If it's not a long, a long question, Stephen, you can type it and let me see. So I'm waiting for you before I jump off today. So if you have any questions, please put them in the comment box. So remember to make time to study as always. Okay, Stephen, you are saying is that it's long. Ah. Okay, so this is what we can do. This is what we can do. Type the question and paste it in the comment box uh, in the video. Okay. So you type it and paste it in the comment box in the video. Uh, like after we conclude the lecture, in the comment box, paste it there. I'll take time to read it and then tomorrow, whilst I am teaching, I will answer that question for you, okay? So Stephen, type it and put it as a comment in the video and I will, uh, I will just pin it on the top of the uh, channel and then I will look at it tomorrow when we start uh, for the day. So still type it and then put it in the comment box for me. All right, so thank you very much for joining the broadcast today. Remember to subscribe to the channel if you have not subscribed. And most importantly, share the channel with your colleagues. My objective is that we'll be able to reach as much people as possible to provide them with this assistance. The way you are finding value in what we are doing, share it with your colleagues, share it with your friends on Facebook, on WhatsApp, on whatever platforms, and tell them about it that Ishira Premium goes live every Monday to Friday, 1600 GMT or at 4 p.m. And you join me so that we can uh, assist you and help you so you prepare well for your examination. So I'll catch you again same time tomorrow as we conclude on business finance, sources of capital, uh, cost of equity, cost of debt, and the issue in relation to weighted average cost of capital. So tomorrow, we're going to be concluding on this topic. And then from Monday, certainly, we will uh, look at some other things else and possibly in other subjects. So thank you very much for joining the broadcast. And I'll see you same time tomorrow. Remember to take care of yourself. And most importantly, most importantly, remember to um, uh, study. I see a question. Let me take that off quite a bit. Wagon Go, your WhatsApp number. My WhatsApp number is 050 114 9296 plus 233 if you are outside Ghana. So if you are outside Ghana, plus 233. Okay, so I'll put that in the comment in the chat box 050 114. 9296 050 -114 -9296. For those of you who want my audio lectures, we have some of these lectures on audio. You can visit my website, the link is in the description in shirapremiumuniversity.com slash podcast and you can get access to the audio lectures. If you are on iTunes or you are an iPhone person, you can go on iTunes, you search for Insura Premium, the link is also in the description. You can get access to some of the audio lectures there. Spotify, Insura Premium, the same thing. SoundCloud, Insura Premium, the same thing. Stitcher, Insura Premium, the same thing. So on all these platforms, all these audio streaming platforms or podcast platforms, you can get access to my audio lectures so you can be listening to them everywhere or anytime that you are free so you can prepare well for your examination. So thank you very much. Wagon, Steven, Achapon, all of you guys, thank you. And I'll see you same time tomorrow. So you take care and I'll catch you same time tomorrow. All the best.